Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here are your hosts, Joe Kuzma and Brian E. Roach. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. My name is Joe Kuzma, and I am joined today by my brother from another mother, the one and only Mr. Brian E. Roach. Brian, what's going on? Hey man, it's a victory Sunday. I'm 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 just uh, you know what this is this is what's going on. <laughs> okay, I was you know, uh, let me get back to that in one second. <laughs> because, okay, because I, I was gonna say you know people are already you know this is our post game podcast for the Steelers victory over the Arizona Cardinals twenty three to seventeen out in the desert, which was Steelers Nation West. Legitimately Steelers Nation West, not just a bunch of people that used to be Steelers dressed up in uh, red and white or whatever other colors they wear. But you and I, we discussed beforehand, we, we were waiting to see how this game turned out before broaching the subject because it is, you know, the window of football is closing ever shortly here, man. I mean, college football is pretty much a wrap now. You know, we've had a good weekend, by the way, for everybody. Who, OH. Yeah, I O. And, um, you know, there's three games left on the schedule and we have to broach the topic now. And I had to see, you know, we had to see how this game against the Cardinals was going to end up, you know, were the Steelers going to do this, this, that, yada, yada, yada. We made a blood pact that if they won, no, not really a blood pact, but uh, there were no rituals involving the killing of ducks, which is what I was actually going to get to because if CBS does this <laughs> or whoever airs a game with Duck Hodges as a starter again, resorts to inserting a Daffy Duck, Donald Duck, Scrooge McDuck, any kind of duck, duck calls, duck this, duck that. Uh, I'm going to say duck it, and somebody's going to have to die. <laughs> That'll be the blood ritual. Got a little overboard, man. I mean, I, you know, the nickname and everything is kind of cool, but when you have um, the broadcast people and they're inserting duck noises into, you know, in between, you know, going in and out of commercial, I don't know, man. It's just, it, it's a little much for my ears. Uh, and before you know it, they're going to be a, Fox is going to bring out like one of, what was it, the Robertsons or whatever, the Duck Dynasty family. They're going to bring one of them on and have them opine on this or do a segment with you know Devlin Hodges but anyways uh oh hey I wanted to mention this by the way too Brian before we get to the duck calling stuff uh one of our commenters uh, over on YouTube had said well now you got to get a Hodges jersey done sir already done hopefully before Christmas it will arrive so <laughs> I'm uh, I'm right I'm riding the wave of my backup quarterback jersey this may become a thing it's just like my kicker football that I have all of the former Steelers or current because Boswell signed it too uh, I was worried about having to get somebody else but he's had a very solid year so you know there's a few signatures on that and that's just because you know I didn't feel like chasing around linebackers like you do with your silly helmet so <laughs> <laughs> I deserve the fart noise there. But you know what? The, the reason we're we're going to talk about the Cardinals game, of course, as part of this, this is kind of where we're looking through a lens and we're asking the big questions because, you know, the New England Patriots lost here, okay? And their three losses are all the teams that are winning their division right now. And this could open up that they're the ones that are the bugaboo for the Steelers headed down on their schedule. If you take a look at some of this stuff, I mean, look, look what just happened with the Texans. You know, <laughs> they just lost to a Broncos team out, out of nowhere. So you never know where they're at, hot, cold, or whatever. And uh, the Chiefs seem to have the number of the Patriots. The Steelers always have the number of the Chiefs. And I'm just kind of wondering, looking down this schedule, how things may shake out. But we'll get to that in a second here because, you know what, the Steelers, they may have something legitimate here provided that the offense is capable of doing something. This is, um, and I can't remember if I discussed this with you, Brian, if it was with the professor in recent memory. I, I talked to so many people. It may have even been uh, our special guest, Ed Smith, for the pre uh, pregame deal. And I'm really I'm, I'm wondering to myself I'm, I'm, who it was I talked to as, I don't know, like some air assault goes on overhead. I don't know if you heard that, but... <laughs> I did. That was like some air raid or something. That was not a duck. But um, <laughs> crazier things have happened. Uh, um, anyways, Hodges only threw uh, 19 passes, and I said, this is going to be something, you know, we were talking about, like, you know, putting your money down on the game over under, Steelers having not scored 30 points in a game, Cardinals having not scored, like, 20 points in a game. Uh, offensively, this resembles a lot of... Old Steelers football, where it, you know time of possession, 
uh, solid defense, keep teams under 20, score more than that. Whether it's field goals or uh, you get the aid of a defensive or, in this case, special teams touchdown, this mirrors a lot of what was happening Big Ben's rookie year, you know, and some other seasons. And even, like I said, the Baltimore Ravens, they made this kind of like their M.O. Uh, in fact, I think when they won with Flacco, that was pretty much what was going on. It was it was solid defense, and it was, you know, uh, the, the kicking game throughout the years with Justin Tucker and winning some close games and and keeping it tight. It scares the bejesus out of me. It does not make me feel I, – I, I squirm in my seat like a child. I can't sit still. And, uh, you know, I wish I wish it would have been the big blowout that you would expect with a, a terrible defense like the Cardinals. I don't know what to expect going forward. I'm cautiously optimistic. But at least, you know, one of these, you know, big contenders that are on the schedule right now this is a big primetime game, and it's going to be played at Heinz Field. So, uh, Brian, what's your you know initial observations coming out of Sunday's game here against the Cardinals? Well, you know, the the bottom line is the defense is uh, is legitimate. Um, I think that that the Cardinals had an interesting game plan at times when they went up tempo. Uh, didn't give them a chance to substitute. Didn't give them a chance to rest. We saw images of T.J. Watt totally gassed on the side of, of, you know, the field. Um, and that may, that may give teams an idea of what they can do if they can keep that kind of tempo up. Um, and I don't think there are that many teams that can do that. But, you know, without that, this, the defense, this is a legitimate top five, top three defense in the league, potentially. And they continue to get better. Um, the offense... Well, the <laughs> offense is what the offense is, right? Um, there, there are people who are ready to give uh, Devlin Hodges a gold jacket, and uh, you know they're drunk. What can I tell you? <laughs> um, it's it's not that I'm I'm down on Duck, Duck Hodges. I think he showed growth today. Uh, I think he he continues to look comfortable and poised. I think that he plays without fear. I think he he does not show the hesitancy that Mason Rudolph had been showing in previous games. All those things are good. Um, I think they find ways to win, which is also, uh, you know, a good thing. Um, but yeah, don't I don't expect this team to to blow anybody out. Um, and the offense is a work in progress. Let's just put it that way. Um, but you know, we saw good things. We saw some nice plays. Uh, they they need to get more experience and more consistency. Uh, but I, you know, when you look at this team as a whole. Um, they're not going to have a losing season again. You know, nobody would have expected that. Uh, you know, when, when, when the Dolphins agreed to trade uh, Minka to this team for a top, you know, what they, what they assumed was going to be a top 10 pick, you know, they had, to, they had to think that, well, guess what? They're wrong. It's not going to be. Um, and if they get into the playoffs, it's not going to be a top 20 pick. Uh, it, the road is open before them. I'm a little leery about next week's game, but we'll talk about that when we talk about that. Um, just because I don't know where points are coming from for either team. <laughs> well, yeah, if you got to see any of that game, um, the Bills, you know, they they contain the Ravens' offense somewhat. I think the Ravens' offense is uh, they're going to have some problems there. I don't know. Uh, you know, the starting center was uh, having some problems, and this is a good way to segue into Marquise Pouncey is not a Pro Bowler this year. Sorry, I said it has to be said. Goodness, that is – he's these snaps are just all over the place. I don't know what the heck is going on, and it's driving me insane uh, just from that standpoint. He's probably still a Pro Bowler anyways because uh, there aren't very many better than him. He still gets downfield, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't mean to be that harsh, but it's been driving me crazy. I saw some of that with Lamar Jackson taking some snaps earlier uh, when they yeah. were playing Buffalo, and, and that game was up in Buffalo, and the Bills defense, you know, they tried to do what they were going to do, but their offense couldn't really do anything either. And, you know, the, the Ravens kind of snuck away with, with that game uh, as it continued on. I mean, Buffalo had a shot, but uh, you're, you're looking at a final score there. It was 24 to 17. So, I mean, it's one of those things, uh, uh, Brian. Yeah, let's we'll talk about the Bills game, of course, when we do the, the pregame for that. Maybe just a little tinge here just because uh, we'll talk about these final three games and whether the Steelers are, are a contender. But, I mean, this, you know, a lot of these things are going to uh, – there's a reminder here, too, that, you know, they're winning – they're finding ways to win these games. They didn't close out the games that they should have been closing out at the beginning of the season, which four of those five games are all against uh, teams that are at the top 
of the conference. They're the top four seeds, right? I, I believe so. It was what? San Francisco. Well, no, not Seattle. Seattle can't be, can they? Because they'd have to be a division winner. So, right. but, but they're still top of their conference, one and two or whatever. And then um, uh, Baltimore and New England. So, and New England might be slipping there too. They may even fall into a spot where they don't get a buy based on whatever goes on because they still got to play Buffalo as well. Uh, you're looking at also a scenario where Buffalo just lost to the Ravens. Now, if the Steelers can take care of business next Sunday, and then you know Buffalo's got to play the Patriots, uh, Buffalo could lose three in a row. They may even end out of the up, out of the wild card picture based on whatever the AFC South ends up doing. So, what are you doing over there? Are you making a duck call? <laughs> no, that was a, that was a squeaky chair, my friend. Squeaky, squeaky chair. You need to get some of that WD forty over there or something. The the liquid wrench, whatever whatever it takes, man. Uh, just remember, do it outside because the fumes for that is just. Pew. So, <laughs> you okay, t- you just t- totally killed me on this. Well, the Steelers are- here. This is the reason why T.J. Watt was gassed to begin with, and I know you're going to agree with me. And I know you were thinking the same exact thing I was thinking when Deontay Johnson ran that 85 yard uh, punt back for a TD. I said, "Well, that took all of you know, <laughs> like a couple of seconds, and now, um." That now that's uh, <laughs> the defense got to get back on the field, yeah. And and what ends up happening is is you know the Steelers are a very deep team and it's very interesting. It was brought up by the broadcast team uh, that was covering this game, which was like you know the CBS is like F team or something like that. Uh, not as bad as Tiki Barber Barber with the lady. Tiki Barber was just a. Uh, just horribly boring uh, during the Browns and Bengals game that I ended up watching too. And Andy Dalton was Andy Daltoning it out there too. So you can rest assured that he still stinks. But <laughs> the <clears throat> uh, the thing they brought up was, you know, we've been talking about practice squad guys, third stringers or whatever. These guys are starters now. We're seeing guys like Dion Kane and uh, – is it Kareeth White? Am I going to get this right this time? Because we both watched yes, it the last time. Yes, there you time. go. Yeah. Yes. Uh, they're making plays, man. I mean, in Benny Snell football, a rookie, this is a guy we said wouldn't even touch the ball unless there was injuries. And lo and behold, there was a lot of injuries. And now he's risen to the occasion, and he's starting to really – he's starting to run angry. He looks violent when he runs with the football, and I and I love seeing that too. But the, none of this should be possible. You get a guy that was undrafted. Uh, when did Duck Hodges come around? Like week three, week four, when they traded uh, Joshua Dobbs. Uh, it was yeah. it was during this you know this crazy Colbert spending spree of you know what I'm going to go get Minka Fitzpatrick, and then I'm going to send Dobbs over here, and then I'm going to get Nick Vanette. And he was just doing all these things, and everybody's like, "What the heck are you doing? Aren't you like packing your bags and ready to leave your job because Ben Roethlisberger's on IR, and this team's going to." stink and they're like you know oh and three or one and three and all this other garbage and lo and behold here you are in the thick of things mike tomlin will not have a losing season this year at the at the very worst they could lose the next three games and he'll be eight and eight uh the kiss your sister 500 but still not a losing season and he's up there with i think it's uh don Schul. i think marty schottenheimer has the record of 14 seasons i think it was elias Sports Bureau. Somebody put this out. I don't remember who. Uh, Marty Schottenheimer has 14. This is Mike Tomlin's 13th season where he will not have a losing record. I mean, that's uh, there's no other company there. This is the only guy who's done this. And everybody to think everybody wanted his job. They wanted him terminated and fired and all these other things. Now, that's not to say that the Steelers can't don't have room for improvement here. It's not to say Mike Tomlin took ownership for a – we should bring it up right here – the punt, the fake punt. <laughs> the he what? took oh, yes, he took Whatever ownership. <laughs> All, but I, I don't think he actually made the call. There's I there's also reports so. Jordan Berry said no, that call didn't come from the sideline. It was a it was a design call, and I just didn't hear the fact that it got called off. But yeah, that was one that if it wasn't the ugliest fake punt I ever saw in my life, it well, it just was. Yeah. So. Uh, Speaking of that, I was trying to find who who uh, somebody put that out there, but now I can't find who it was. <clears throat> so yeah, it looked like uh, Jordan Berry was dumbfounded by it, and everybody else had didn't have a clue what was going on. And it's just whatever. So there is the stats guy, and I know you saw this. It's, a, it's Michael Birch, I believe is how yeah. you pronounce his name. And he said, with today's win, Pittsburgh clinched its 16th consecutive season with a 500 record or better, second longest active streak, streak in the NFL and longest streak in team history, uh, second, second longest active streak in the NFL. I, got, I have to think that's the New England Patriots because even when they missed 
they missed the postseason or they were like, you know, they didn't win their division with Matt Castle, however that ended up. I think they were still like nine and seven. So I think they're the only ones. And it's like a lot of people talk about, you know, Mike Tomlin wasting talent and, oh, he should. This has been the counter thing. You're Everybody's talking about Tomlin for coach of the year, which we haven't really brought up here just yet because uh, it's still going to need to see. If he makes the postseason, I think he's a shoe in for that award. I don't see how he couldn't be. Uh, I know there's some people that have turned around and done some, you know, great things, but. You know, you're doing this with this isn't like this isn't Baltimore who drafted a whole bunch of new guys and signed some guys and moved some parts around and things of that nature. Oh, I was going to say Mark Andrews got hurt in that game too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, hurt yeah. his knee. So who knows what's going on with that? I mean, we'll see what they do now with injuries and their next man up. Uh, Mike Tomlin, this is, this is the thing you talk about Bill Belichick doing is grabbing a random guy that somebody else didn't want, like oh, let's say Chris Hogan, for example, and throwing him out there. And all of a sudden, he's like a Pro Bowl player. And uh, you know, making catches in the Super Bowl and things of that nature. If New England wasn't in the AFC, it would probably be the Patriots and Steelers for the most part in almost every single Super Bowl because it's just it's wild uh, just to think that Mike Tomlin has not had a losing season. The Steelers haven't had a losing season going back to Bill Cowher in like the very beginning of Heinz Field opening. Is it been? Has there been one losing season, right? To Heinz Fields open, I believe, maybe two, maybe two. And it's you know, and it hasn't been open for thirty years. Even though the one guy who you know we sat, we may have gotten drunk and sat in the wrong section. Brian, I've had these seats for thirty years. That's what this guy tells me and my buddy. This was a few games ago, and I just looked yeah. over him and I'm like, "There's no way you've had these for thirty years. This building hasn't been here for thirty years." And then I politely walked right across the road to where my seat. I got in the wrong row. It's because I got. I actually it was drinking. I wasn't actually drunk. I don't get drunk. You know why? I spend too much on tickets. There's no way I'm getting drunk and not remembering the game. But I do have my fun. And I was talking with somebody, and I ended up bleh, in the wrong section, and I made some old-timers really upset at me. So <laughs> they were like, we've had these seats for 30 years. No, but, you know, entitled Steelers fans, those yinzers. But anyways, uh, you know, the, the long standard of success here, and Tomlin able to do it, I, you know, I think the – Cinderella, the whole it turns into a pumpkin thing, the the wheels fall off, whatever you want to say. I, I think that comes at some point. I mean, you can't expect the the defense to hold like this at all times. They end up playing a team that has like a very high powered offense, like maybe Kansas City or something. I, I don't know. Uh, but at the same time, maybe the offense continues to grow. Maybe somebody like James Conner or Juju Smith Schuster. Maybe they're like holding these guys off to be 100% healthy, thinking, hey, this is working. We could win. We don't have to rush these guys out onto the field. And if you add the, those guys to this mix and they're not detr detrimental to the team's success and they add to it, there's no telling what could end up happening. That's, that's the key to this. I mean, look, this is they find a way to win. You've got, you've got a defense that is full of grown-ass men. Um, you know, you got it. Oh, uh, there's too many. At least How 11? many grown ass men? <laughs> yeah, eleven. It's just full of them. There's eleven grown ass men on that defense. Um, you know, you've got uh, a secondary that's playing really well. You've got a, a set of outside linebackers that may be the best pair in the league right now. Um, you've got you know a front, a defensive front that's playing you know lights out with both Cam Hayward and Javon Hargrave playing great, and Tyson Alualu picking up whatever slack he can. Um, and, and then you've got good linebackers. Uh, you know, even Mark Barron is playing well right now. Go figure. For the most um, part, yeah. Yeah, for the most part. Um, I, you know, it's when, when you have a defense like that, if they can continue to limit teams the way they have been to under 20 points a game, then this team has a legitimate shot to win against anybody. And, and that's, that's, that's the bottom line. It doesn't matter that the offense is not – uh, you know, Ben Roethlisberger's offense and a, and a high-flying offense that's going to put up close to 30 points a game. doesn't matter because as long as they can get contributions and the offense doesn't lose the games for them, they're going to be in every game and they're going to have a legitimate shot at winning every game. Yeah, I think so too. And this isn't, you know, you're always counting on – Ben Roethlisberger to get you back into games at some point. The defense has turned around to I, I think we've all forgotten, you know, they made the move to move up and draft Devin Bush. 
you've almost forgotten about him. <laughs> and it, it's not because he isn't playing. Vince Williams is the guy who hasn't been playing. Vince Williams yeah. is dry, like falling off a cliff, and, and you know he's out there a quarter or less of the game anymore if you pay close attention. Uh, I know I'm passing downs Barron's out there. And you know what? Even when I get upset with Barron, he's still like light years above what they had in the recent years. Like I would take Barron over, let's say, LJ Fort or Sean Spencer or anybody like that. Or, or even if you had to go and put Tyler Matikiewicz out there, I think we, I think we know where those players have like a defined role, what they're good at and what they're not good at. And I think that's yep. the balance that's there. You know, it, it's just funny going back and looking at all of these different things, all these different storylines. You, you know, going from back from the off season, we were really be banging the drum for Devin Bush. We didn't really think we were going to get him, and they did. And Minka Fitzpatrick, the same thing. And we were talking about, oh, is this a bad trade, this and that. There's all these things that everybody's forgotten about, like that predate that. Uh, we were talking about how they signed Steven Nelson, for example, and we were saying, hey, the Steelers' secondary, and this was before they picked up Fitzpatrick. Steelers' secondary is very strong now with Mike Hilton and Steven Nelson and Joe Hayden. And you talk about grown-ass man, Joe Hayden – just he's lighting it up, man. He, yep. it, it's just it's 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 coming on when it needs to come on. It's December. Everything everything's at stake, and it's starting to really uh, move forward. But even beyond that, you know, we were talking about there were people who were saying, well, getting a three and a five for Antonio Brown that was stupid. Not resigning, you know, Le'Veon Bell that was stupid. And you could look back at all of those moves, and it's like, well. Maybe it would have been nice if you had a healthy bell. You'd have no idea if those guys would be producing or not if they were still on the team, and you would have a lot of money invested in them, whereas you know, we're going to have to be looking at a lot of different contracts and stuff coming up. We were telling a lot of people that the light bulb would eventually come on with Bud Dupree. I said, hey, it takes four or five years for some of these edge rushers to – you know, they just don't come out of college and, you know, you shoot them out of a cannon. Very few. There are some that do. T you know, T.J. Watt looks like a defensive player of the year candidate. So does Minka Fitzpatrick. Yep. You have all these guys, like, on the same field right now. But Dupree is lighting it up. I said, you know, l go look at some of the former Steelers. I mean, James Harrison took forever to actually get on the field. I want to say Porter was pretty good, like, right, right from the start. But there were some other guys. I I'm trying to think um, – who did Harrison beat for the sack record, Brian? I'm drawing a blank. Uh, who's Jason my guy? Jason Gilden. Jason Gilden. He may have been one, too, but I have to look. It's been so long since I discussed that. I just remember Michael Strahan being the guy that took three, four years to become one of the all-time greats at taking down the quarterback. And I'm not putting Bud Dupree in that category by all means. He could be you know, one, one, one year wonder, one hit wonder here. But – it looks like he's really coming on. He's looking like a guy you could depend on now to make plays. He's out there. He's harassing the quarterback. They Kyler Murray really didn't have a whole lot of places to go. If it wasn't Kyler Murray, they would have had like 13 sacks today. I mean, it's just it was just ridiculous the amount of pressure that was being put on the quarterback. He went down five times. I think I had that kind of in that category. He wasn't throwing any picks. He threw what three tonight. It's yep. just, you know, they're they're forcing things to happen. They're making the splash plays happen. That was the thing that's really been missing. They're playing they're playing aggressive, they're playing with speed, and there doesn't appear to be any great weakness. Even losing Stefan to it, which I couldn't imagine if they had him still on the field, they're still getting it done. And I guess it really helps that the defense is for the most part, for all intents and purposes, that they're healthy because the offense really isn't. You, you were looking at everybody was talking about replacing. How are you going to replace Antonio Brown? How are you going to replace Le'Veon Bell? Even though Bell had already been gone for a year. Okay, we got those replacements. We think Juju Smith-Schuster, James Conner, haven't been here. I know I've said this a few times till I'm blue in the face, but then you have Ben Roethlisberger. You have who's supposed to be his future replacement that was drafted, Mason Rudolph. He gets benched. Here you go. Here's some guy that's a, a champion duck caller. Can he throw the football? I don't know. Let's find out. Man, did he throw some beautiful passes today. All of them to Deontay Johnson, maybe one or two to James Washington. But, man, there was one in a real – there were two tight window passes to Deontay Johnson. There was one where I think Patrick Peterson – it was a zone, I believe. Uh, Deontay made a break toward the sideline, and the ball was already there. The, the guys on TV followed me. Just I kind of said it to myself because I was, I was sitting in the living room watching by myself. But um, they, were they were talking about um, – Hey, he put some zip on that ball, and that's the one thing yep. that you know we've been saying back from training camp. We said this guy could probably play uh, if you need him to play, 
And I know they're not relying on him to throw 30, 40 passes. We haven't seen what that might look like yet. But for what he's doing, it's still some dink and dunk. Who cares? He's getting it done, and then he's making the plays where it needs to be. That one was beautiful. I believe that was a first down conversion. It may have been on a third down, but I know it was a decent uh, a decent chunk. He's found Deion Kane a few times. Then there was the touchdown pass to Deontay Johnson. And Deontay Johnson, his field, his, his vision, he had a play. He looked like Barry Sanders on an end round. <laughs> it was yeah, like was he nearly kissed the guy, face mask to face face mask and the defender and just ran around the other end. These things are all clicking right now. James Washington, they're talking about him being farm strong. We knew this already. We knew the size of his hands and how he could get up and how strong he was with combat catches. It's starting to, it's starting to be this, it's the runaway train and hopefully it's not just, you know, organized chaos and it's something that could continue. Absolutely. This is look. As, as this offense continues to grow and develop within itself, you're seeing connections being made between Devlin Hodges and Deontay Johnson, between Devlin Hodges and James Washington. You're starting to see some chemistry build. Um, you know, Benny Snell is running better and with more authority. Jalen Samuels had a decent game running the ball uh, today. Um, you, you, you look and see an offense that is starting to find its identity, um, and that's just going to improve. And, you know, the, the thing that, that, that sits in the center of this is that it is – this is an offensive team, right? My, Tomlin has talked about, you know, winning one for team or, or taking strides for team. This is a team. Uh, it's not a bunch of individuals. It's not a bunch of stars. They're on the offensive side of the ball right now, there probably aren't any stars. Um, you know, it's, it is a team effort. And they are melding very well. And when that does happen, special things can occur. Um, I, you know, what I like right now and what I see is that, that Hodges is making smart decisions. He's not, you know, he's not hesitant when he feels like he can get the ball where it needs to go. And when he doesn't see anything, he's either throwing it away, he's running for first downs, he's doing good things with the ball. And, and you know, other than the, than the one uh, fumble by Benny Snell – you know, they're not putting the defense in bad positions. Except for um, Jordan Barry. Well, yeah, but that's <laughs> Jordan Barry. You know, I look, you know, <laughs> Tomlin tried to take the heat for that and said, it's my call, it's my call. I don't, like I said, I think that's Tomlin covering for his punter. His punter, there's a miscommunication. This stuff happens. I think that's exactly what happened. I think they had a fake punt on because they saw the right, the right look on the field. I don't think it came in from the sidelines. I think it was just something they'd said, if we see this, do it. And then it got called off because everybody else went to cover. Yeah. Nobody was playing like it was a fake punt except for Jordan Berry, and hence he got creamed. <laughs> um, I mean, he's probably lucky he didn't get killed. <laughs> yeah, probably lucky the ball uh, didn't get scooped up for a TD either. Yeah, I mean, those things will happen. Um, but you know, that's that's Jordan Berry, and I, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna enter into that. I'll let that offset with the fact that Deontay Johnson scored a, a punt return touchdown, which hasn't happened in what a billion years. Um, and may have may have sealed Ryan Fitzer's Ryan Switzer's fate. Yeah, uh, for guys. real. <laughs> that one, as as I'm sitting in the the Southeast Pennsylvania Steelers uh, fan groups place at Dave and Buster's watching this game because it wasn't on here. Um, <laughs> the number of people who just went, if Ryan Switzer was out there doing that, that wouldn't have happened. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Kareth White had a pretty bad kick return or punt. He did, yeah, several was, of them actually. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he got the one at the ten, and he barely got to the fifteen. I, I blinked. I was like, Kareth White, or is that uh, Ryan Switzer? I, I, I got him. My went cross-eyed. Yeah, I mean, you know what? These receivers right now are looking pretty strong. You add Juju back to that mix. Heck, I'll even kick it. Uh, I'll punt it over the next year, and you either draft a guy. Or, you know, let's just say Ben comes back and Ben is Ben. Holy cow. I mean, it's just it, the needle's definitely pointing in the right direction. Uh, I really do like I, – I've liked the moves that they made. I mean, White is doing a lot more than Brooks James was ever going to do. And, yep. uh, you know, for them to go and pluck these guys off of uh, practice squad and say, you know – we could get veteran. We could have got veterans, and Tomlin said this like a week or two ago. Somebody asked him about this, and they were like, "But you know, they're not ready to play right off the couch." And these are guys that they scouted and they they looked at film from, you know, d during the off season or whatever. Sometimes they're guys that they played against or um, 
preseason, a lot of times that's happened where, you know, he sees a big guy like Phil Nueva on uh, on the other side, on the Eagles sideline. And, oh, what is that? I like these giant guys. And then he molds them into men like Zach Banner, Phil Nueva, McCullers, you know, molds them into these mountains of men that end up making some contributions, some more than others, of course. And, uh, oh, you know what? <laughs> Speaking of Phil Nueva, he got tagged with a penalty that Matt Filer was just as guilty for. I didn't think Matt Filer had a very good game today. And no, it was a little that was concerning. That was where Duck Hodges was running for his life most of the time is because uh, of Matt Filer's play there at right tackle. He he was just he did not look sharp today. He, and he was like one of the highest graded guys by the PFF Wizards too, Pro Football Focus for the, the unknowing uh, who grade all these games and all these players. And uh, you know, that's something he's going to have to be sharper. He's going to have to be better at that. But for the most part against a bad defense, uh, they found a way to turn this out. They found a way to turn this time of possession, which was not very good at the beginning, uh, you know, and, and make it their way. Uh, they came out with like eight, eight, an eight-minute drive that ended in a field goal. And you're just like, okay. And then they end up getting a drive. They used uh, all a minute and 51 seconds to end the, the first half, and they, they got another field goal. And you just wished that they would get a little bit more out of this than just field goals, but – you know what? I, I think we've been spoiled before. You had the t- high power Todd Haley offenses, but you also had like it, this criticism was there a few years ago. I think even with Haley, where they weren't putting up the promised points with all these weapons and everything like that. And I'm coming back full circle to that for one reason. And, you know, this is the reason why Bruce Arians was, you know, not renewed, basically fired, is because when you go back and you look, and I brought this up with Charlie Batch playing games and stuff like that, it was it was always Jeff Reed or Sean Sweezham or somebody kicking a bunch of field goals and a Troy Polamalu pick six or something of that nature, low-scoring games, and the Steelers stayed competitive and they would win games. And this is reoccurring yet again. But even for people who say that Mike Tomlin had all this talent and he wasted it and they still think he's not a good coach or whatever, really think about it this way. This is, And I wrote an article about this uh, last week if you want to go to the website and check it out. Mike Tomlin's gone through this. Now, he mostly had Antonio Brown. There's been spells where he hasn't had Ben by injury or suspension. Uh, there's been uh, spells where Le'Veon Bell, two years in a row, where he lost him. You know what I mean? And then, yeah. he, then he had D'Angelo Williams, and he lost him too. And he goes into the postseason, and they drag out a win somehow, or they nearly lose Ben in that game too. Cincinnati shoots themselves in the foot. And then they end up going on, and they, they play in a divisional uh, round playoff game. I think that was that, the Broncos. And then they were without Antonio Brown. They were without Bell. They were without D'Angelo Williams. They're playing guys like Jordan Todman. This is all old hat. The one that really, I think, hurt Tomlin the most, uh, you know, if people were thinking all that, and they're like, oh, killer bees. Well, Martavis Bryant wasn't around. He was hurt here or suspended to begin the season, sus- suspended for a full year. Uh, Le'Veon Bell sits out a whole year with the franchise tag. I mean, you go back, and people used to talk about the killer bee thing and all this talent, and then they used to put together how many games they actually played together, and it wasn't very many over however many several dozen that they should have played together or games total that had been played while they were all under contract or on the same roster. So Tomlin has always been – He's, these guys have always kept their eye uh, down, down the road. You know what I mean? And unlike other teams that are you know bad teams, they can't afford to lose like a star player or two. You look at training camp, and you're like, man, the guys the Steelers are cutting, it, some of the times they're able to trade them and actually get something for it. And, you know, the same thing with Dobbs or, you know, in the past, Ross Cockrell, Sammy Coates. They traded Sammy Coates, I think, for a conditional pick to the Browns a couple of years ago, too. And yeah. they've been deep, and they've been very deep, and a lot of that does deal with the coaching. And I think that that's the main reason why, you know, you look at a game like this, and you're like, well, you got to be crazy. They got lucky. You know, they had these turnovers, and uh, they had this, you know, special team splash play, and really maybe they should have lost to the Cardinals. Maybe, maybe. Because, you know, they had the same amount of first downs if you take out penalties. They both got 16 not by eight a penalty. Steelers ended up with 20 because they had four by penalty. Cardinals only had one. They converted the same amount of third downs, four for 11. They were uh, The Steelers were only one of four in the red zone. Uh, they ran the same amount of offensive plays. And the Steelers had uh, basically – Where's the offensive yardage at? I can't even find it on here. I had the first downs and everything else, um, but they were, you know, they were almost neck and neck here uh, in a lot of different ways. But this is the reason why, like, one of these teams is eight and five, and the other team is three, nine, and one. 
And you, you can't even go and say, well, they play in a division with the 49ers or the Seahawks because the Steelers played those teams too. You know what I mean? Yep. The Steelers yep. are playing against the preseason Super Bowl champions, the Cleveland Browns. They're playing against the Baltimore Ravens. So there's still competition there within that division as well. So you can't really make that excuse for it either. But it's still – it's all coaching. And this is the reason why when I ask if the Steelers are legitimately a Super Bowl team, you look at the next three games and you think – can they win these? How many of these games can they win, and can they legitimately win them? Where does that put them in the pecking order? Could they be the five seed? Could they be the six seed? Et cetera, et cetera. I don't. I don't know that you necessarily look at this game and say, well, that's all the more they are. They beat a bad team. They beat a bad Browns team the week before, and now they're going to get pummeled by the the Bills, maybe the Jets on the road, and the Ravens. Uh, yeah, I, I look. You know, as I said, I have concerns about this upcoming game, but I think. I think legitimately you should you should be able to anticipate they could beat the Jets. And when they play the Ravens, the question will be what Ravens team are they playing? Um, you know, if if the the Ravens schedule is is pretty cushy up until that point, um, I think they play who uh, the Browns one week and the Jets one week. So, you know, if they win those two games, I don't think that they're playing for anything in that last game. And are you going to risk Lamar Jackson in that kind of a situation if you're the Ravens? I don't know the answer to that, but my gut would tell me no, you're not. So if they sit and play their second string uh, groups, that's a game the Steelers and, – and the Steelers could potentially win even with their starters because they almost beat them the first time around. Yeah, seriously. Um, but, you know, with, with second-tiered players in – there's no reason to think that the Steelers can't go down and win that game. Uh, to me, the biggest question on the schedule remaining is the, probably the Buffalo game because it's the best defense they're going to play. And the offense, quite frankly, uh, despite the fact that, yes, everybody's very excited, they had some nice plays, the offense is not still not that good. Um, and to try and, and put too much on them to score, especially against a top-level defense, it's going to be tougher. So that's a questionable game to me. I, I, of course, I'm going to pick them to win, but it's a questionable game to me. Um, but there, it's also at the same point, if things go the right way, they could easily win all three of those games. And if they win all three of those games, now you're talking about a team that's 11 and five, um, probably has the fifth seed, if if uh, you know locked up at that point, depending on, on on other things. But I mean, that's assuming they beat the Bills. Now they'll have the tiebreaker against the Bills, and then the Bills have to play the Patriots again. Um, so there's no guarantee that they're going to, you know, win that game. The Titans, who are, are coming on strong, have two games against Houston, who tanked against the, the Broncos. What the hell is going on there? Um, Drew and, Lock, and, Drew Lock is the truth, I guess. I guess. Well, hey, you uh, didn't not, see the you typo. Know. You didn't see the typo. Um, they were showing a graphic during the game, and it said that in in that game, Drew Lock three TDs, I think an interception in. 3,107 yards passing or whatever. They added like a an extra digit. <laughs> oh, wow. That's pretty impressive. That hey. was. I mean, he's, he's, he's got everyone beat almost. <laughs> yeah, and, and then the other team the Titans play is the Saints, you know, just some other team. Oh, um, yeah. So, you know, th there's a, certainly a chance the Titans could lose their next three games. So, you know, that, that pretty much says the Steelers have a very good chance to be in the playoffs. Um, you know, if they, especially if they can win one or two of these last three games, I think they can afford to lose one. I don't think they can afford to lose two, but, but maybe they can. Um, and it, the thing is once a team like the Steelers gets into that, you know, uh, second season, this isn't a team you want to play, uh, because they're, yeah. yeah, they got nothing to lose. They're not supposed to be there, and they got a nasty defense full of grown ass men. <laughs> well, you know? that that's that's where I was angling towards, Brian. Because you know, okay, so the the Ravens have the Jets, Browns, and Steelers. Mm -hmm. None of those games are really going to do the Steelers really any favors. I mean, unless they just nope. officially eliminate the Browns from this whole con conversation. Excuse me, hiccups. The worst time ever. Um, you get the the Bills are playing on the road back to back. They come to Heinz Field, primetime game. Then they got to go to New England, and you know that could kind of start to knock them out of this contention as well for the postseason. 
Yep. You, you start to look at um, your 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 wild card team. So you you got the Texans still sitting atop their division at eight and five, but so are the Tennessee Titans at eight and five. The Colts lost too, so they're kind of almost out of this conversation now. They're at six and seven. The Raiders are at six and seven. Uh, these teams got to win out. You're almost looking at, like you said, Buffalo can end up knocking themselves out if, and Tennessee, depending on what these guys do with their games and the Steelers, you're, you're kind of looking at a three-horse race right now. Now it all depends on if the Steelers take care of business against Buffalo and they even end up with the same record at the tail end here. They would have the tiebreaker over the Bills. They would end up being a five seed. Now why might that be important? I don't know. You think the Bills maybe as a six seed could upset someone? And then you you never know. You get all the way to the AFC Championship game. What if it was Pittsburgh and Buffalo and it'd be played at Heinz Field? That would be crazy. It's it's crazy talk. It's like you're saying there's a chance, the Dumb and Dumber line. (laughs) That's basically what it is. I don't want to make it sound like that's what's going to happen, but I'm trying to take this from the angle of legitimate Super Bowl contenders. Somebody's going to be like, no, New England always own – they steal their lunch money. Well, they beat the Patriots last year at the end of the season – and the Patriots were starting to look like that same kind of team again last year. And I know it's not the same team as this year. I, you know, I hate making those comparisons sometimes. But the Patriots lost all five of their losses last season in a Super Bowl winning team were all, uh, winning year. They were all two losing teams with losing records. Every or teams that didn't make the playoffs. So, you know, the, it, it, you don't say it can't happen. If the Steelers avoid the Patriots somehow and don't have to play them, if they're the five seed and the Patriots end up being, let's say, the three seed, that means they don't have to go to Foxborough to play the wild card weekend. Let's say if the if the Patriots fall out of favor here and it ends up being uh, Kansas City jumping ahead here. I don't know. I'm looking at the Ys and Xs, and it's uh, – so Kansas City's already clinched their division, so they're going to host a home game regardless of when it is. They've clinched a playoff spot. The uh, Baltimore Ravens have clinched a playoff spot, have not clinched the division yet. Find that a little interesting. I didn't know who to root for between them and Buffalo, to be completely honest. Because if they would have lost to Buffalo, they've had their you know they've had their shortcomings against the the Steelers, the the Bengals, and the Browns. You know all although they they don't have the Bengals again, but it's happened at the end of the season where they've lost the teams that they shouldn't lose to. You know things happen. Yeah. Steelers they went into a downfall, a downward slide at the around this time last year, ended up out of the playoffs after you know starting very hot. These things happen. Uh, it's just a shame that it doesn't happen with the Steelers playing in the NFC East, uh, yeah. <laughs> where you got a six and seven Cowboys team that's on top of the division. So you know, <laughs> I'm just looking at this from who might they end up playing. I, I think Baltimore will have a bye. It's going to be between Kansas City and the and the New England Patriots down to the wire. I think to see who who else has it. If they end up at five, they don't have to go to either one of those places. That means they're going to play at either Houston or Tennessee. If they play in Tennessee, that's going to look almost the same way it looked tonight in Arizona. You know how many Steelers fans are down in Tennessee? It'll be insane the amount of people that will probably buy tickets and go there, and that's basically a road trip and a little bit of nicer weather when you're you know around the first of the year. Who's not going to go do that? So that could be very beneficial for the Steelers. Houston, you know, Texas, the great state of Texas, they have Steelers fans there too. I don't necessarily know that the Texans are a, you know, a team that the Steelers couldn't, either one of those teams, the Titans or the Texans, I think they match up with very well. The Chiefs, they've kind of, uh, they've been to, you know, the Patriots are to the Steelers, what the Steelers are to the Chiefs, even if it's played at Arrowhead. The Steelers have been consistently beating the Chiefs for several years and have basically owned Andy Reid. Not to say that it's still the same because with Patrick Mahomes and all this other stuff, that team would scare me. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say it's not that it's impossible. You mentioned if, let's say they win a game and then they end up having to play at Baltimore, a familiar opponent that now has to defeat them again. Those are never good matchups. Ask Baltimore. No. Ask Baltimore about this. You know, from years ago. Ask the, ask them what they think about Troy Polamalu. <laughs> yeah, I mean th- that anything can happen, and now all of a sudden you're you're talking about 
you know, a team that gets on a roll there and starts to believe, they could end up in an AFC title game. I don't know against two, but I'm just saying, you know, we put it up here. The only one that I think gets in your psyche is if they had to go to New England just because of their lack of success in playing them and playing there uh, throughout all of the years. I don't think anybody would feel good about it. I think people would already be packing it in and saying, well, it was a fun ride, this and that. Even though the underdog thing, it could happen. It, it doesn't happen very often. It was the first time since, what, like back in 2017 against the Panthers, I think they said, where they lost tonight to the Chiefs at home. They hadn't lost at home in forever. Since Shep was a pup, I used that one before. But these are all scenarios where, you know, even though you think we're taking crazy pills, th- this is somewhere where the Steelers may actually uh, they may actually match up pretty well against several of these teams, and they they can have a run provided they get in the tournament. Absolutely, there's uh, you know, look, there's no question that the defense of of that we have right now is good enough to to provide this team with a chance in any game they play. And that's all you can ask for. And, I, and I'll include the Patriots the way that their offense has been stinking the joint up the last few games. Um, they can they got a legitimate shot in any game they play. It doesn't mean I think that they will win all those games. It doesn't mean I think that there's a, you know, a good chance that they go to the Super Bowl. But there's a chance. And and I and I don't I think that that's an impressive enough statement all on its own considering what what they have had to deal with this year, um, that you know you should just take that for what it is. It's at the moment there's a legitimate chance, and you know barring uh, you know some injury that we certainly don't want to occur late in the season, um, you know if they can take care of business, pull out a couple games, maybe surprise uh, a couple teams. Uh, and win a win a wild card game. Look, you know, stranger things have happened. Uh, this this is a team that's done this route once before. You know, go on the road and win three times and go to the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, it's not unheard of. It's it's certainly you know, and it's not even unheard of to do with with a quarterback like Devlin Hodges. Yeah, you know. Not from not from the standpoint of the Steelers. They've always had, you know, when they've gone, they've had quarterbacks that were franchise level quarterbacks, except for one that I don't want to talk about because he, he, he shall not, shall not, not be named. named yet. <laughs> it rhymes with um, O'Connell. No, I'm not. No, it's too close. Don't say it. We got we got <laughs> vibes that are good right now. Let's not bring any of the bad vibes in. Um, but you know, there are other teams, Ravens, um, that have won Super Bowls with <laughs> multiple less <than> times, <laughs> multiple yes, times, less than elite quarterbacks. Uh, you know, so it, it could happen. Um, don't don't uh, comment comment uh, about like you said that we're taking crazy pills. It's well, not that we might say be. it's like we, <laughs> we we probably are. Um, if if there is such a pill as a crazy pill, and if I had them, I would probably take them. But I don't. <laughs> uh, I, I think. Look, it's just that there is a chance. The defense literally is that good. Um, nobody's gonna. I, I just don't see anybody lighting this team up. That's the point. Um, and you know, unless the unless the offense makes huge mistakes, turns the ball over repeatedly, puts the defense in bad positions, I don't see this team getting blown out. Which means they're going to be in every game. And if you're in every game, it means you've got a chance to win. Absolutely. And we've seen them win with Chris Boswell kicking five, six field goals in a playoff game, and that was with da 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 the Killer Bees. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it, it could very well happen. Um, and it, you know, they couldn't even score points or generate points. That was that was with Bell, AB, and Ben. I don't think I'm not sure they had Bryant on the field when they played the Chiefs at Arrowhead for that one. But um, just a, just a little bit of closure here, Brian. Uh, just with the win today. Uh, so Teresa Varley it's, is just backing up what I just said. 13th straight non-losing season for Mike Tomlin, one of three head coaches in NFL history to begin his coaching tenure with 13 non-losing seasons. And I know one was Marty Schottenheimer because he has 14. The other one is Don Shula, by the way. Some good company to be in. And uh, Jordan Berry on the fake punt. This is from Mark Caballi, who uh, got to talk to him after the game from The Athletic. And he says, I thought we were clean. I was ready to run up there, and they all shot off to cover, and that's when I was like, oh, duck. 
He didn't say duck, apparently, uh, but it was bleeped out even in the tweet. Uh, and then he says, the play is on if the look is there. I thought we were good, and they called it off up front for some reason, and no one told me, so I just ran full speed into some, in some guys waiting for me. It was kind of unfortunate, but we can laugh about it now because we won. Uh, so he didn't hear the fake, uh, the fake punt called off. It's probably a look or something that they have built in. I do remember them. I do remember Robert Golden having this same exact conversation, very similar to this, except it was successful, and that was against the Bengals when they were already, you know, beating the Bengals by a sizable yeah. amount. And then he threw the pass on fourth, and it was like, "Why'd you go for it?" It was almost like the Woody Hayes thing, you know. Well, we have this call; it's built into it. Why, Woody? Why didn't you go? Why'd you go for uh, two? Couldn't go for three. So yeah. <laughs> that's the way I think of it. So you know, this is a thing, and it looked very stupid. And I think everyone is drunk with watching the Dolphins score with their punter throwing to their kicker the week before. And uh, there were several fake punt attempts in the NFL. It wasn't just the Steelers. In fact, the Cardinals had one. They should have been snuffed out. And Tyler Matikiewicz tripped, and Cam Kelly fell over him, and you know things happen. And uh, you know. I just wish that, you know, I, I had some fingernails and hair and everything else left that I didn't pull out or bite off and everything. These games always give me some anxiety. I'm sure I won't feel any differently on Sunday or for the remainder of this season. And, uh, you know, I don't take anything for granted, but it, it's this has been fun. I know we all have like a morbid curiosity of wondering what would life be like without Ben well, you're without Ben this season. You're seeing what it's like. You're seeing it can still continue and be good. And the good news is you probably end up with him back next year. And there's going to be a lot of advocates that are going to say, well, we can win without this guy and this guy and this guy. Stop it. I don't even want to think about that right now. Let's let's stay on the ride that we're on right now. Let's keep the pedal to the metal. Uh, this game was very much like that Chargers game, Brian. I think I tweeted something out earlier, and I said, you know, Duck Hodges was assisted there, special teams, TD. The Chargers game was a defensive touchdown. The Steelers were playing some time of possession type things. Don't screw it up. And they didn't. And lo and behold, there you go. And, you know, I think the if you if you took the line, uh, you would have been good this time on that two and a half points. And, you know, we'll look forward to talking about this upcoming Sunday night football game against the Buffalo Bills later on here in the week. And I think we also have some special programming that's going to be coming along the way as well. So uh, whatever closing thoughts you have, Brian, go ahead and rattle them off. Uh, I'm just going to say this. If, you, if you're not following – uh, Devlin Hodges and Zach oh. Banner on Twitter. You need to be because it's funny, and uh, the, the 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 banter which Ramon Foster is now even getting involved in between the two of them is 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 well worth the follow. So if you're not, do it. <laughs> well, I had it. Hold on, I'm going to find it here because. There was like a play where, you know, he actually ran out. <laughs> Zach Banner did. This is the, you know, um, this is number 72 where everybody's cheering for when he's reported eligible. And he kind of runs like a little, like, little curl route, I believe. And he says after the game, he's been tweeting back and forth with Devlin Hodges. And I know he had something that was more of a slip of the tongue. I think he called Hodges a hillbilly or something like that, or that he inspires the hillbillies or something. And some people got offended. And it's like, you got to understand these guys are jo they're having banter back and forth. He was telling them that he wasn't even following them on Twitter. I've said far worse things to Brian, trust me, and in public. Uh, Absolutely. But he says, Zach Panner says, I'm keying my initials in your car when we get back. And he ats him <laughs> at Devlin Hodges 10. Great team win, though. That's his hashtag. Not the ref stink. Um, well, and, and then there's the one that where Devlin after at, at some point yes. Devlin said, "Can you imagine if I threw you the ball and you dropped it?" Yeah, the cheers and from instead of all the cheers would turn to boos. <laughs> and I know you don't want that, <laughs> so that's why he didn't throw him the ball. That's his excuse. So yes. uh, we do we do have to talk about that, Brian. The ref stink. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like uh, this. This is what I'm going to say. Uh, it, early in this game. Uh, and and I, I, it, this is just a carryover from the Ohio State game, too. Apparently, holding just doesn't exist anymore no. in any game as far as anybody's concerned because, oh, my God, uh, the refs literally stink. Not to mention when, when Dan Fouts calls you out <laughs> and says, it's right in front of you, obvious pass interference, why aren't you throwing the flag? You stink. That's Dan Fouts is a terrible announcer, and if he calls you out, you really stink. The refs stink. Hashtag the refs stink. They stink. Ed, Ed Smith loved that, by the way. 
He loved that the refs stink. He, he's he's going just as bonkers about it too. We had a little sidebar that wasn't recorded with that uh, that we were talking about it too. So, uh, and you know what, you your uh, hashtag may get appropriated by Patriots fans who aren't happy as well because uh, <laughs> they had a pass interference call that didn't happen. They had no more challenge flags left. They had like a TD that was taken off the board that you know should have been a touchdown and they said no nah, and Nikhil Harry was uh out of bounds here or whatever and I was just like hey you know what they call that I have to leave that's called karma I think it comes karma. full circle finally I, I was, hashtag Jesse caught it I'm actually yes yes it makes it all the more worth it I just wish it was a bigger game with more at stake uh, maybe it does I don't know but uh they'll still end up winning their division and whatnot and everything else so we'll end up seeing anyways Brian thanks for joining me once again today and uh we will reconvene soon here to you know talk about the next game absolutely it's always a pleasure my brother from another mother absolutely and uh folks if you're out there don't forget to like comment subscribe we've been trying to keep up with them I mean I think the one had like a hundred and some comments and it's like okay I don't know my eyes are getting crossed there's a guy who didn't use periods or anything or capitalization <laughs> and uh he said some stuff about you know he would rather have somebody other than Tomlin who's a first year coordinator even though he's only done something that only two other guys in the history of the NFL have ever done and you know it's better than a zero year coordinator like <clears throat> Freddie Kitchens. So, <laughs> yeah. anyways, uh, yeah, don't forget to like and uh, subscribe if you comment uh, at your own peril. Uh, my name is Joe Kuzma. His name's Brian. And we always encourage our listeners out there to be safe, be good, and we'll catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 